Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. What went wrong with capitalism? If there's anything wrong, that is. It's a capitalist critique of the only system we've got. From author and chairman of Rockefeller International, Rushir Sharma. When things on the upside, let them run. The moment there's the slightest flutter or something is going wrong, we're going to intervene and the government has your back. So this is not what capitalism was really meant to be. And a sunny July 4th travel forecast from flight tracking site Hopper, economist Haley Berg. This summer, most airlines have added back more capacity than they had pre-pandemic to some of these top international destinations. Combine that with more normal demand and slightly better jet fuel prices, we end up with much better prices. Plus, a Surgeon General's warning slapped on social media. We know this. Thank you for saying it. The weekend in presidential politics and Swifty's impact on, of all things, monetary policy. Taylor Swift actually moves entire economies. It's Monday, June 17th, 2024. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand Becky by in three, two, one. Cue it, please. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick along with Joe Kernan. Andrew is off today. Welcome back, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. It was a fast turnaround. It was. You know, it was, I was... Uh, I was on the top of a hotel at a pool, and you know what ruined my Sunday? Having never to get on get a plane nope. and come home? Endless helicopters. Saturday. Sunday. Sunday and, you were on a plane, right? Um, yeah. Was it? It would have been Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. Endless helicopters. Yes, yeah, Saturday. Endless helicopters. You know for whom? I do. Yeah. For whom the bell tolls? No, not for the bell tolls. <laughs> for whom I the Joe know. Biden tolls. For, for the president, who, who was at it. I was in Los Angeles on you the west side Angeles, of on the west out, side of town. You were out for the fundraiser. <laughs> they, where do things get lost in email? A lot of times people spell my name K E R N A N. So you didn't get your invite. I did not get my invite. So I'm out there, you know, all dressed up with nowhere to go. You know, Clooney, all friends of mine, Julia Roberts, uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Hey, Jimmy Kimmel, and uh, there I was, um, all dressed up. Not invited. I wonder why you made such a short trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I guess I wasn't on the list. Yeah, no. This one, uh, when I'm reading it, I, I think that you think about it, is this news to anyone? And if it's not, then why is it taking so long to, to do something about it? The, the, the U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, uh, said he's going to push for a warning label on social media platforms telling parents... Uh, that using the platforms might damage adolescents' mental health. Is there anyone that, that hasn't sort of at least thought that something like that? I mean, we've talked about it's it so been many times. It's impossible to get anything done. Right. But get now. Any regulations brought against it. Just seems like stop the presses. Uh, the Surgeon General uh, it, it wants to require approval by Congress uh, to add warning labels or needs it, and no such bills have been yet introduced in either chamber. Dr. Murthy said in an essay in the New York Times that the effects of social media on children and teenagers is a public health risk on par with road fatalities wow. uh, or contaminated food. Good luck with the, the K Street lobbying money of big tech. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. If you go can't nowhere. even put a label on this, if you yeah. won't even allow Congress to pass that, uh, we talk about this uh, routinely on this show, about the protections for children and, and, and how lacking they But it, it just, it, our frustration with... You know, with it, it, it just is front and center, though, because we know this. Thank you for saying it. But now it's going to be, you know, it, it's out there. We, it's already been out there, but I highly doubt you're going to be able to get uh, much done. You might get some, uh, you know, like they may make it look like they're trying to, to do a few things, but uh, it, nothing real is going to happen. And it, and the, it seems like the, the horse has left the, That's the barn at this point. That social media is. It's not coming years, back. It's 2004 when Facebook was first introduced and all the ones that have come since. Yeah. It's scary to be a kid yeah. these days. And there'd be a lot of pressure. It used to be you could go home from school and, and the, the pressure would stop. The wouldn't follow you. Yeah. 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 Uh, hopefully we they, they, I get bullied. On, uh, not to that extent, but uh, everybody gets bullied on social media. It's a, right. it's a bad adult. place to be. It's Reddit, it social media, it's a bad, bad place. And the anonymity makes people act like they're, they're subhuman. 
at times, right? Yes. And if you ever pinned them down, I think they'd be. Ugh, well, they, 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 you say things online when you're anonymous that you would never say to somebody face to face. Right. You wouldn't say to you, you worse any, much less a total stranger, a, a total right. stranger. All right, just 10 days to go before the first presidential debate, the Trump and the Biden campaigns have agreed to rules that were set out by the host, CNN. The 90-minute debate will include two commercial breaks, during which the campaign staff may not interact with their candidate. Podium positions will be determined by a coin flip before it. Microphones will be muted except for the candidate whose turn it is to speak. No props or pre-written notes will be allowed on the stage. Candidates will be given a pen, a pad of paper, and a bottle of water, and this could get pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, 10 days. First time I think they've ever said you're going to cut the mics entirely, except for the one who's allowed to be talking on this. Right. And, and definitely people don't get the questions in advance. Are we sure that CNN? Are we oh, sure? They, they, they will not get the questions in advance. Uh, there might be a little wiggle room for Biden on that one. I think, for, don't you? Well, really? I, I wouldn't go that far. They have had issues in the past. There was the yeah, issue with CNN? Brazil in the past where she I mean, did give some of the questions. You have to. Otherwise, no. I would say The stakes not. are so high for our, our wonderful mainstream media with this election. And Trump is such a different candidate. It wouldn't be a bad thing to maybe game it a little. Do you think? I mean, the stakes are. I'm not going to throw shade at another news organization. <laughs> the shade. Okay, but the stakes are so high. I just think that the ends justify the means in this case. No, I, I don't think that's cool. That's what I, no I read that a lot. Chance. Okay. Yeah, let's hope for the best. Yeah, as we prepare earlier, for the worst. The Biden campaign raked in more than thirty million dollars at a star-studded event, a fundraiser in Los Angeles. President Biden appeared at the fundraiser alongside former President Obama, actors George Clooney and Julia Roberts, and comedian Jimmy Kimmel. Here in LA, tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing Presidents Obama and Biden at a fundraiser, even though. I don't know if President Biden's even in the country. The president was in Italy for the G7 summit today where he had a little bumping foreheads time with uh, Pope Francis. These very personal, intimate decisions are now being made by nine unelected judges, one of whom flies his flag upside down. The other one, one of the others, um, drives around in a um, $267,000 gift on vacations. and. I think we are all wondering, what can we do about this? Elect me. Biden made some forceful comments on the Supreme Court. He noted that the next president is likely to have two new Supreme Court nominees and said that uh, that is one of the scariest part of a second Trump term. The Democratic National Committee said the L.A. event brought in its biggest ever haul from a fundraiser. There were some questions raised about the president at the end of that fundraiser when he was kind of guided off stage. Uh, but again, this is a very closely contested race, very closely yeah. watched. It's weird. The, 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 the contention from the White House is that the video is, is fake or somehow. Now, I understand what they're saying, that you can take in a little bit of applause and stand there for a while and soak it up a little bit. I don't think that was a freezing moment. No. But you can't change that he kind of was, like, let off. The state, I mean, Obama, uh, President Obama grabbed his hand. It looked like visiting angels. It looked like escorting an elder off the, I mean, you saw it. It looks like it, I mean, it looked like visiting angels. Um, here, let's, let's walk. So I don't know how you can say at the White House that that didn't happen. And it, I hear that a lot. Don't believe your eyes uh, for what's happening. But in either event, um, you're right, it was Saturday. My mind is mush. I left yesterday at 7 a.m. And it was on the, I guess, I don't, you know, since I did Everything not, since I did not get an invite, I don't know where it was exactly, but there were choppers going crazy uh, all day Saturday for, for the event. I bet. So it's a lot of money. That's good. Mm -hmm. But does being with Jimmy Kimmel and George Clooney and to, it, it, do most Americans say, wow, that's great. I want to do what George and Julie, Julia and Jimmy say. Do most Americans say anything, though? This is pretty. No, I think it's bad. I don't think that's I don't think those are I think in general that the whole Hollywood sort of influence. I mean, you could is, say the same thing about CEOs when you have CEOs who will come in and maybe. say things about you. I guess too. maybe it's my I, it might be my perspective. Uh, well, it's there's there's nothing that is universal in America at this point. Like you're going to have I don't know. I, I think I, 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 I think opinions on just about everything that comes down. I think Hollywood types 
sort of saying things about, you know, they're free to say whatever they want, but uh, I, I just wouldn't get much of my, uh, I wouldn't get any of my political views or science views or, it's just they probably wouldn't be the people I'd go to for, you know, to bone up on a subject. The Bank of England's latest policy decision is due Thursday. The UK's uh, central bank is expected to hold rates steady ahead of uh, elections early next month. But it may begin laying the groundwork for a rate cut in August or September. But strategists at TD Securities are warning that if Taylor Swift's Eras Tour uh, does what people think, it could delay a rate cut. We're talking about people flooding into the UK to see her uh, final UK tour dates in August should bring an influx of spending that could skew inflation data. The TD analyst said that the surge in hotel prices uh, could be material, could actually show up in economic numbers, adding as much as 30 basis points to services inflation. That could be enough to make the uh, Bank of England rethink a rate cut. We're not kidding. We've, we've it's about, about the sixth or seventh time that we've talked about something related. Chicago, Chicago yeah, thing. Yeah, something it's related to, to the, the numbers we report on yeah. skewed by the, the Taylor Swift effect. It, it's interesting. We used to talk about a stock like a stock that had the Oprah effect on it, Oprah Winfrey, with right. like Weight Watchers or something along those lines. But Taylor Swift actually moves entire economies. Yeah. Yeah. Economic numbers. Yeah. Next on the podcast, what went wrong with capitalism? Investor Rushir Sharma looks at who our system leaves out and what to do about it. It's become almost analogous, as I've said in the book, to our culture of pain management, which is that you get the slightest pain, you give them opiate. Right, so when you have an opiate crisis as a result. Similarly, like on the economy now, the risk has become socialized. It's a provocative conversation like only Squawk Box can do, coming up next. Welcome back to Squawk Pod. And this next interview got heated in a way only a squawk debate about capitalism can. We invited longtime Squawk Box guest, Financial Times contributing editor, and Rockefeller International Chair Rushir Sharma to the studio to discuss his latest economically and politically provocative book. Sharma joined Joe, Becky, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Here's that conversation. Join us now for a future Nobel laureate, I think, uh, after this, uh, maybe not, but uh, Rushir Sharma is here, Rockefeller International Chairman and Breakout Capital Founder and CIO. We just had just a moment, Rushir, I'm so, I'm so pleased. His new book is out today, What Went Wrong with Capitalism? The whole, the whole thrust of this book, basically, is that capitalism has been, uh, I guess it's been ruined yes. by big government. And we don't need capitalism 2.0 or some type of woke capitalism. We need to return to real capitalism because big government spending, uh, deficits, regulations have spoiled capitalism. And, and the reason that you name it that is you know no one's going to read it. You're projecting. You're no, projecting. He just There's said that. Elements of the book no one's going to read like it. That. No one's going to read it if you don't. You could preach to the choir. You want to bring in people that hate capitalism and show them what the real problem is. Yes, exactly. And I think that so far that seems to be succeeding. Although today is my launch day, but good. Uh, Everybody it, should read this. Right. But you know, but uh, the early buzz. What I can make out is this, which is that. A lot of people have come on your show and spoken about how government spending is out of control, how budget deficits are out of control. What I try and show in this book is that it's the suite of government habits. If you look at regulations, we introduce now, America, 3,000 new regulations a year. And don't uh, get rid of, of any of the old ones. In the last 20 years, we've gotten rid of 20 regulations in total, right? right. So 3,000 every year, we get rid of 20. Then we've become a bailout nation. You know, it's a history that even I learned as I was researching this book which is that back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, right up until the 1980s, the concept of the American government bailing out a private sector company was heretical. It was said, we don't do this. Then you get the first big bailout in 1984 of Continental Illinois. Yep. And after that, it's been a succession where you get progressively bigger and bigger bailouts, where now it's become almost analogous, as I've said in the book, to our culture of pain management, which is that you get the slightest pain, you give them opiate. Right, so when you have an opiate crisis as a result. Similarly, like on the economy now, the risk has become socialized, which is that when things are going well, you know, right. when things on the upside, let them run. 
The moment there's the slightest flutter or something is going wrong, we're going to intervene and, and we, uh, the government has your back. So this is not what capitalism was really meant to be. So it's a suite of government habits. On your show, you had people focus just on government spending or even the Fed in yeah. terms of the asymmetry of the Fed. But what the book tries to do is to show you over the last 100 years how capitalism has progressed to this very distorted form of what we have today. Right. Bernie Sanders would like to call it socialism for the rich, but You're this right, is really Andrew. socialized and, risk. Andrew, there is something for everyone in this, because we're not, this is not just government's fault. This is big corporations yes. that want bailouts. Yes. But they ruin capitalism too. That's the thing. So we've got problems from government yes, and, because they've socialized and corporatism. The, the problem right. is that the, the, the gain, it's, this, but that, it's a cliche, the gains have been privatized, right. the losses have been socialized. But, yes. but, but the moral of the story remains that if you can, you know, they're both at fault, governments and corporations, but capitalism in its purest form is the way we need to go. We need I'm to not sure you that say that either, because you also talk about competition. Yes, but I say like in the book that That's the what basic capitalism is. Of no, but that there's not enough competition. Right, but yes. that, 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 but that would, goes that, to the government part. And that hurts capitalism. Yeah, because But regulations, you need government to do that. But my regulations, Maybe. Andrew, oh my tend to be pro-incumbent and pro-big business, because who are the people who are able to game the regulations? Who are the people who are able to pay for the entire reg regulatory environment? It is principally big business. If you look at small businesses today, the cost, for example, on Wall Street, you speak to people, the cost of setting up a new fund today, if you're a small person, is 10 times larger than what it used to be 20 years ago. So you can so never get you, it back. Yeah, basically. exactly. So you have all the big hedge funds, the big people who are out there who are able to do it, and you have these like enormous growth there, but for anyone new looking to do this, it's become very tough. And this, that's just a microcosm. It's yeah, happening across businesses. Well, this, is a, this is an age-old problem. The lobbyists and everybody who can get a congressman or a congresswoman to listen to them and take their... I, 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 I want to add just one piece of context or nuance to that, though. Sure. That is true in the world of finance. It is not true in so many other worlds, because I would argue to you that now we have this backbone called the Internet and the technology that anybody can use a cloud and sell product I mean, the idea that somehow the incumbents are always going to win, I think that there's a lot of truth to that in certain cases the, the, of the biggest. But in terms of the amount of small businesses that could come online over the last 20 years as a function of technology is a remarkable thing. No? Yes, Andrew, and yet what my data shows, over the last 20 years, right up until the pandemic, the number of new startups in this country is actually declining. Yep. Economic, social, economic and social mobility have declined. The probability of you being a billionaire and becoming entrenched has gone up 40%. So like churn has reduced in general in the economy and that's why capitalism, as I argue right. in the book, is not working for the average person. Therefore, in America today, most young people, when they are polled, say they want socialism, not capitalism. But what they don't realize, I think, is the fact that what you have today is not the, the capitalism right. the way it was meant to be. This has become socialism for everyone in a way. Risk has been socialized. That's the point I'm trying to make in the book. It's the suite of government habits. And of course, I'm not even going down the path that we're running a 6% budget deficit when we have full employment. Right. That's a different But how aspect. much do you think the government is captured? A lot, I think, because if you look at even you know, things like lawyers right, in this country, America always had the highest number of per capita lawyers in the world. But the last 20 to 30 years, the growth in that has gone parabolic. That's right. just telling you about what's being captured. Who are the biggest lobbyists today in Washington? They are the tech companies. The big mega cap tech companies are the biggest lobbyists back in Washington today. So right. there's been a well, massive the, regulatory But who is pushing? But the reason I'm asking you these questions is because, you know, from a from a party perspective, political party perspective, who, is, who do you think is pushing back the most and who do you think is pushing back who's the least? Who's gonna save us? If corporations are doing it and if, if corporations are too powerful and government is too powerful, who can stand up for capitalism, pure capitalism? Who's gonna do that? not, but as I said, today in America, 70% of Americans are saying that they want major economic change and the polling language used is they want the economic system in Europe. torn down. Yeah. Right, in terms of that. And in Europe, it's even higher because they have an even more distorted version of capitalism than we do. And yet, as we go around the world, I offer examples in the book uh, from Switzerland to Taiwan to in Vietnam that you give people more economic freedom. Typically, people tend to do much better. Those societies tend to be happier and right. you end up getting much So how do we get growth. back to that? What you, we're, we're, we're screwed. How do we get back to that? Well, until, unfortunately, you know, that we get a crisis. There, uh, and the government is out of its ability to rescue and to spend, 
there will be no turn. That so it's more awful. of the same. <laughs> until there's an absolute, complete collapse, basically. Where, collapse, but you know, like, until the ability of the government to do this, because what I show in the book is progressively every decade, the habits have gotten worse. As I said, we never bailed out companies until the 1980s. Uh, you know, like in terms of the stock market reaction, that every time the stock market is flying, it's fine. But, but you're stock- talking about Great Recession or Great Depression. No, I'm not talking about a Great Depression as well. I'm just trying to say that something needs to be able to get people to course correct, right? Which is that for now, we have this sort of attitude, which is you know, very true also, which is the, the, like of the Biden administration, et cetera, that things are great, right? Economy is growing at two or 3%, stock market's flying, we got AI, why do we need to do anything? Great, right. we had and, a great financial crisis, that didn't do it. Then we had a global pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. and that didn't do it. Because they made it worse. Well, I, that pretty nuclear. much leaves a nuclear war. Nuclear, <laughs> <laughs> fallout. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that, which is maybe coming too, with Putin and everything else. Yeah, but I'm just trying to highlight it here in terms of, as I said, the first step to a cure is to diagnose the problem. Okay. Today, the problem that, you know, like a lot of people say is we need more intervention to fix these problems. We need more intervention right. to fix inequality. I'm saying that you got into first, uh, like all this mess and this disaffection with capitalism because of the way that you have been running government or, you know, for the last 30, 40 years. And I said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So yeah, I'm not sort of doubting right. that. But the outcome that we're getting today is very perverse. Right. I'm just telling you, one party's paving us with a hell of a lot more good intentions than the other, Andrew. I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Rushier. Squaw Squa- Fox is coming right back. Cheese will be next. Coming up on Squawk Pod, summer holidays are booking up, but it's not too late for a July 4th trip. Hopper lead economist Haley Berg says there might still be a way. You have to be flexible, depart on 4th of July, come back a weekday the week following, and be flexible on where you go. You might be able to find a deal that way. And AI, plenty are loving it, but not everyone. Uh, Ronald McDonald isn't a fan of the company's AI chatbot. Uh, test details uh, next. I don't know if we, is that really, do we know that Ronald's not, uh, I don't think he makes any of these big strategic decisions, does he? Mm, maybe, maybe he does. Maybe. Maybe using a little bit of. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can License. do that. You're listening to Squawk Pod from CNBC. Today with Joe Kernan and Becky Quick. Stand by Joe. His mic and cue. Welcome back uh, to Squawk Box. McDonald's uh, reportedly firing its artificial intelligence drive through chatbot, uh, at least for now. The fast food giant told franchisees it's ending its AI partnership with IBM uh, no later than July 26th. Uh, the, tech, uh, w- the technology will be removed from the more than 100 res- restaurants that are using it, but McDonald's didn't dismiss the prospect of more drive through AI, telling trade publication restaurant business that still sees an opportunity to explore uh, voice ordering solutions uh, more broadly. I'm just trying to figure out how this played out, what it got right, what it got wrong. Right. Think about Siri when you're talking to her. Exactly. <laughs> you get anything. People order very specific things. I Don't didn't do order a McFish thing. sandwich. Right. I haven't ordered one of those in 40 years. You don't? No, I, I, I probably haven't had one in 30 years. That's what I order. Do you really? On Fridays? filet fish filet fish There's no McFish. Well, you had to have I forgot the name even. It's been so long since <laughs> I've ordered did. one of those. Right. It used to be a Friday thing in our house. I think it's one of those fish that... It has two eyes on top. Yeah, I think. Maybe. I don't, I don't, even, I, I don't even know if they know that. No, it's not. It's probably not. I don't think it's a flounder. Good. I think it's something else. It's like some, some generic, sort of like, fish. yeah, some generic fish that's probably disappearing. Fourth of July weekend is quickly approaching and already millions of travelers are expected to be taking off. According to travel site Hopper, 24 million seats are expected to depart from U.S. airports. That's a 7 percent increase from this time last year. Joining us right now on the outlook for travel and what it's going to cost you is Hopper's lead economist, Haley Berg. Haley, where are all these people going? We're seeing a lot of demand to major U.S. cities, which is typical over long weekends. So think New York, Seattle, L.A. But as with most summers, Europe is top of mind. And there is a tremendous amount of demand also going to London, Paris, Rome, Athens, even Tokyo, which is a top destination. 
More people traveling, are they paying more or less than they were last year? Less. Airfare domestically is down about 18% compared to this time last year. International airfare is down different amounts to different regions. But the good news is most travelers are paying 10% less or more on some of those most expensive long haul tickets. Why, why is that? Is it uh, fuel prices down or something else? Fuel prices is part. Another part is capacity. Last summer, we saw an incredible amount of demand to destinations in Europe and Asia in particular, but capacity hadn't recovered. Most airlines had focused on domestic capacity coming out of the pandemic and weren't there yet on international when international demand exploded. This summer, most airlines have added back more capacity than they had pre-pandemic to some of these top international destinations. Combine that with more normal demand and slightly better jet fuel prices, we end up with much better prices than last year. What about rental cars once you get there? Rental cars in the U.S. averaging about $48, which is pretty much in line with last year. $48 Over a day? $48 I, I, a day. I never imagined paying 48 bucks a day. I'm always looking at more expensive prices. Is that because I'm putting too many add-ons on or paying for insurance or something? likely is driven by where you're looking to pick up a vehicle. Take Florida, for example, you can get a rental car in Florida, most major cities for about $20 a day. But if you're renting in New York City, another major hub, you'll likely see higher prices. You get so tired from pedaling those cars you're talking about, Haley. I think that- uh, <laughs> Me and my suitcase wouldn't- These are actual, $20? I need, yeah. You need to send me the, the list. I actually rented a car in Florida, and I can attest about $24 a day is what I paid. What was the car? Like a subcompact. The Maybe a subcompact. Yeah, an EV. <laughs> They're trying to get rid of They'll it. They'll pay you 24 to drive one. Yeah. Oh. Really? What was the car? What kind was it? It was a minivan. What? No way. I rent minivan. minivans, and it's like 100 bucks a day. No, Sometimes I get that. 800 bucks a day. I get that. Here, we have a minivan for you. Well, you don't understand. Uh, they, they, I wouldn't. I'd pay twice not to have to drive. I, I twice pay as from, especially if you go to Orlando. <laughs> Forget it. Everybody wants a minivan. Oh, God. Um, Haley, let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, hotels. What about those uh, costs factoring into it? Uh, where does it stand this year? On average, about 232 per night for a hotel stay. But rental homes are very popular, especially in the U.S. for travelers going out with family for the long weekend. Those are averaging about $400 a night or about $200 per bedroom per night. So most travelers looking at at least a two bedroom vacation rental. Has that capped prices for hotels? Have they not been able to raise prices more because people would prefer to go to an Airbnb or a VRB, VRBO? If you're traveling with, with family, it's it, a heck of a lot cheaper. Most travelers are making those trade-offs themselves. So prices between rental homes and hotels are actually very competitive. What we typically see is that consumers are self-dividing. If it's a larger family, most of the time they're going with a vacation rental if the economics are better. But think about a city like Miami. Oftentimes in cities where there is such a high supply of hotels, it can actually be cheaper to rent multiple hotels rooms than get a vacation rental on the water, for example. So in different markets, the competition is different. But most of the time, we see that hotels and vacation rentals can be pretty comparable, as long as you're not looking at a luxury beachfront house, the pool, et cetera. Haley, we, we've got to run. But uh, very quickly, if you haven't booked already, is it too late? It's late, but there are still some deals available. You have to be flexible, depart on 4th of July, come back a weekday the week following, and be flexible on where you go. You might be able to find a deal that way. And what you want to drive. Yeah. EV, exactly. a minivan. Pick your choice. You may be in a Toyota Sienna. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Toyota Sienna. Haley, thank you very much. Great to be with you. That's Squawk Pod for today. Monday, a new week. Thanks for being here. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern. Get the smartest takes and analysis from our TV show right into your ears when you follow Squawk Pod wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet you back here tomorrow. We are clear. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.